you know, as I said, can I welcome you to the series? Uh, and it continues uh, with this evening's uh, webinar on the long term cardiovascular consequences of preeclampsia and other placental syndromes. And you're delighted to have our very own uh, Professor Christian Dellis uh, speaking to us on this. Uh, Christian is Professor of Cardiovascular Prevention at the University of Glasgow, is also the Deputy Director of the BHF Centre of Excellence in Glasgow and Head of School for Cardiovascular and Metabolic Health. He's also the Vice Chair of SHARP uh, and he's been uh, a strong supporter of the work that SHARP has done for a long time. So we're delighted, Christian, to have you with us to speak on this. Just a number of uh, housekeeping rules. Um, if you could just mute your microphones while Christian is presenting, and then we'll have uh, ample time at the end for questions. And please feel free to unmute, uh, turn your camera on and ask questions, or even just type them in the in the chat box if you wish. So uh, without uh, any further delay, Christian, can I welcome you to uh, present uh, on the long-term cardiovascular complications <clears throat> of preeclampsia and other placental syndromes. Thank you, Christian. Well, thanks very much, Jacob. It's it's really appreciated. Very kind words and um, welcome to the audience. I see a big team from Dundee, so special welcome to them. It's it's great to see um, good colleagues and friends here. Um, I must admit I'm always a little bit nervous when I need to share with uh, via, via Teams. Um, let's try anyway, if it works. I think it should. Um, Let's just see that this goes in the right direction and here we should be. So hopefully I hope everybody can see the, the screen now. Yes, we um, can. Yeah, that's that's very kind of you to confirm this. Thanks, Jacob. So let's let's go through this today. So it's it's a topic that I find really fascinating and I would like to justify in the first few slides why I find it so interesting and fascinating from a research point of view, but also from a clinical point of view, of course. And part of this justification is that I had an, or have an interest in life course of cardiovascular diseases for quite a long time. And it was in part triggered um, through my participation in the Lancet Commission a few years ago, where we really looked into the life course of the development of cardiovascular diseases. And of course, what we've seen here is what many other people have um, seen before, of course, that our average life course is like this here, that we have a few people who have advanced cardiovascular disease so that they um, develop cardiovascular diseases much earlier in life. And what we would really like to do is to push this life course back to the ideal life course where cardiovascular diseases develop as late as possible in life. And now, of course, we all know that if we want to prevent cardiovascular diseases, we would have to start in this continuum as early as possible. And ideally with the risk factors, of course, and that is what SHARP is about and that is what many other um, societies about, but, are about, but SHARP is particularly interested in risk factors such as lipids and high blood pressure. Now, when we look at these risk factors throughout my research life so far, I have always been interested in hypertension. I have always been interested in kidney disease as one of the risk factors for cardiovascular diseases. I always had an interest in diabetes, and more recently, I developed this interest in differences between men and women, or more broadly in sex and gender aspects of cardiovascular diseases. And if we just look at the sex and gender aspect here, of course, some of this can be explained by changes in the genes between men and women or differences in genes between men and women. Some of the differences between men and women are because of hormonal differences, so sex hormones, of course. But some of the differences between men and women are also gendered. So in terms of the work and life experience of men and women, the social concept of gender that also affects our susceptibility and the course of cardiovascular diseases. And then apart from these sex and gender differences between men and women, we also have conditions that are specific to one of the genders. So for example, in women, we would have conditions such as breast cancer that simply don't occur in men or just very rarely occur in men or breastfeeding or of course pregnancy. And some of these sex specific 
factors can, of course, also affect our cardiovascular risk. And this is where my interest in these conditions comes from. So I hope this is a bit of an explanation why I'm interested in this factor, uh, in, in this concept. And this is something that we have certainly also seen in other people who deal or have an interest in um, women's cardiovascular health, where there's a number of checkpoints from childhood to early and late reproductive phase to menopausal phase, where we see risk building up in women and opportunities for really meaningful intervention at these different stages. But let's focus today on pregnancy and pregnancy that doesn't go so well where we then have placental syndromes. Now, certainly the prime example of a placental syndrome, and then we'll come back to, to more details a bit later, is preeclampsia. And preeclampsia, many of you will, or all of you will, of course, know preeclampsia is a pregnancy specific condition. It is characterized by hypertension, high blood pressure, proteinuria. It typically occurs after 20 weeks of gestation. And it typically also occurs in women without pre existing hypertension. Of course, we have conditions such as superimposed preeclampsia, where there is already hypertension chronic hypertension at the beginning of the pregnancy. But the tricky thing about preeclampsia is really that it can happen and in most cases happens in women who are entirely healthy when they enter their pregnancy, so no pre-existing conditions, and then they are severely unwell with hypertension proteinuria and have all these maternal factors here, including renal failure, coagulation problems, and more severe forms such as HELP syndrome or even eclampsia. And there's also a significant um, effect, of course, on the baby. So for the fetus, there is intrauterine growth restriction. There can be preterm delivery. And preeclampsia overall remains the main cause for maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality in all um, societies. Now, preeclampsia is, of course, a condition that is not only dangerous, but it nicely aligns with my own research interest because preeclampsia is characterized by hypertension. Preeclampsia is characterized by a renal phenotype. Preeclampsia is more common in women who have diabetes and preeclampsia, as we will see, is also associated with a long term risk of diabetes. And it is one of these conditions that only occurs in women. So it gives us these kind of gendered factors, which is also one of my research interests. Now, just a couple of slides um, as a reminder about one of the concepts of the pathogenesis of preeclampsia. And the idea is, of course, that during a normal pregnancy, the arteries that supply the uterus and then in pregnancy in the end supply the placenta will have to remodel completely to accommodate the increased blood supply that uh, the baby, the growing fetus actually demands. And normally we have this remodeling from these high resistance, low flow vessels into a low resistance, high flow vessel. However, in preeclampsia, this remodeling during pregnancy doesn't go right. So the vessels remain small, they underperfuse the placenta. The placenta will then be ischemic, sends out a lot of systemic stress signals that then lead to high blood pressure and kidney disease. So that is one of the most common models to explain the phenotype of, of preeclampsia. However, preeclampsia is only one of the conditions where this happens. We have other conditions such as other forms of gestational hypertension or other forms of fetal growth restriction, where we also have this impaired remodeling, where the vessels do not remodel from small to large in a way, but remain small and underperfuse the placenta. Let me just reiterate this again in a, in a slightly different way. So we have these conditions, the preeclampsia or preeclamptic toxicemia, gestational hypertension or babies that are small for gestational age. And all of them are characterized by a placental hypoperfusion. And some of this is triggered by an impaired remodeling of the spiral arteries so that the placenta remains hypoperfused. So to some extent, whilst we will talk a lot about preeclampsia as one of the most dangerous conditions in pregnancy, the pathogenesis of these conditions is very similar, and they are often taken together as placental syndromes. So 
be clumsier gestational hypertension and um, growth uh, restriction or small for gestational age could be similar um, phenotypes. If you look at preeclampsia again across the globe, you see that um, in most developed countries, the um, prevalence of preeclampsia is there, but it is relatively low. But we have a massive prevalence, especially on the African continent and here in uh, Southeast East Asia. Um, part of the reason is really related to income and to development. So here, when we look at the Human Development Index, one of the, the measures for um, uh, economic wealth in these countries, you see that the prevalence of preeclampsia is actually reasonably low in more developed countries and relatively high in the less developed countries. And this may have genetic reasons, this may have reasons in terms of access to health care, this may have reasons in terms of how healthy pregnancies are generally in uh, some countries versus other countries. Um, but it is, of course, even in the more developed countries, still a significant factor in terms of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality. Now, what is Interesting for today's evening and um, for my research is not only the pathogenesis of um, preeclampsia, but it is really the long term risk. And let me introduce a patient to you that I've seen in the clinic a few months ago. So a woman 33 years was previously completely well, like many of the women are who enter pregnancy and then develop preeclampsia in gestational week 34. So that is a relatively late onset preeclampsia. The blood pressure in the pregnancy, in this preeclamptic pregnancy, was up to about 160 over 100. She had two plus proteinuria, so one of the other defining um, factors of preeclampsia. There are different definitions. It's not always necessary to have proteinuria, but this is a very classic case with high blood pressure and proteinuria. The renal excretory function remained normal, so that is good news. She developed, she developed uh, moderate to severe peripheral edema as another um, characteristic of, of preeclampsia. And then everything went well. A healthy baby was delivered gestational week 37, so a bit early, but not terribly early. And then after the delivery, a few weeks, uh, a few days after the delivery, the blood pressure was pretty much back to normal with 132 over 86 millimeters of mercury. And the question, of course, if we see such women in a hypertension clinic is, should we monitor this woman now in the long term here? Is she at higher risk because she had an episode of hypertension? Um, would she have hypertension again later in life? And what is actually her lifetime risk in the first place of cardiovascular diseases and hypertension after this preeclamptic pregnancy? Let me just show you a, a number of really, really rather ancient papers here back in 2007, but there has been plenty of work since then, and it all confirms this. And if we go to the more kind of ancient literature here, it's just a little bit more clear and less papers that have been reviewed. So let me you pick this one here. What, what you see here in, these, um, uh, in this uh, meta-analysis is that women who had an episode of preeclampsia, when you followed them up in terms of hypertension later in life, there is a risk of, in this study, about 3.7 fold higher risk of developing hypertension later in life if you had an episode of preeclampsia. So that is quite significant. Confidence interval is somewhere between 2.7 and 5. So there is maybe a threefold, roughly threefold higher risk of developing hypertension after a preeclamptic pregnancy. This is not only for hypertension, it also translates into other conditions. So women who had preeclampsia are at higher risk of developing ischemic heart disease. You see again something like two to three fold higher. There's other cardiovascular diseases such as stroke. Again, roughly two fold higher risk. There's not a higher risk in terms of breast cancer, so that is a really good negative control. We're really talking about the cardiovascular risk and not a general risk. But unfortunately, these cardiovascular diseases, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, thrombotic complications and stroke also translate into a higher 1.5 up to 2 fold higher all cause mortality in women who ever had an episode of preeclampsia. So we're dealing with something that is not only dangerous in the acute situation of pregnancy, but also in the longer term. <laughs> 
And this is not only true for preeclampsia and cardiovascular diseases in that sense, but it is also true for other placental syndromes as defined previously and other cardiometabolic conditions such as type 2 diabetes. So the same situation here, women who had any form of hypertension in pregnancy are in this study also at higher risk of developing diabetes later in life. And it's again this kind of magic roughly twofold higher risk um, of diabetes later in life. So there is a large number, and this evening is really not to review the complete literature, but um, just two other random papers here that show people have really, really studied this, this quite well. And the general consensus is that if you had an episode of preeclampsia, your risk of hypertension, cardiovascular and metabolic conditions is about twofold higher in the long term, two to two and a half fold higher. What is more is that if a woman had one pregnancy complicated by um, preeclampsia, you see that for cardiovascular diseases, for coronary heart disease, stroke, um, uh, thromboembolic events, we are again either not quite significant or in this range of one and a half, two percent, uh, twofold higher risk later in life. But what is really, really um, important is that if a woman had a second pregnancy complicated by preeclampsia or a third or a fourth even, then these risks are even, even higher. Um, so I think that is an important message for counseling, that we are not only dealing with a recurrent risk of preeclampsia that is a risk to the pregnancy, but also the long term risk of cardiovascular diseases is higher if there is recurrent episodes of preeclampsia. So we've also done a little bit of, of work just in the in the Scottish population. This is an analysis from the Generation Scotland cohort, and I don't want to show you more than these um, not very nice looking um, um, survival curves here. But basically, it shows again that women who had um, preeclampsia and survival in that sense here is the, the risk of cardiovascular disease later in life. Um, their their um, so event-free survival is a little bit lower than the women who had a normal tensive um, pregnancy, so it's also true in the Scottish co um, population and not not just elsewhere in the world. So we always see this roughly two to two and a half fold higher risk of these conditions. Now, for those of you who are not um, interested in the clinical aspects, uh, or more interested in the clinical aspects and not so much in the mechanisms, this may be the time to grab a drink or a cup of coffee. I just want to spend two or three minutes on some of the underlying mechanisms that really bring the preeclampsia together with cardiovascular diseases later in life. And of course, preeclampsia is in a sense a vascular disease because we don't see this remodeling from smaller arteries to larger arteries to supply the uh, placenta. And the remodeling in uh, pregnancy is normally driven by growth factors, by vascular growth factors. And when they are there, um, the remodeling occurs. When they are not there, the remodeling doesn't occur. And we have, of course, um, the risk, uh, the, the association of the circulating angiogenic factors and the risk of preeclampsia. So if we have enough of the angiogenic factors, then the risk of preeclampsia is low. If we have anti-angiogenic factors, such as these factors here, or low levels of placental growth factors, then the risk is higher in uh, to develop uh, preeclampsia. So this has been established and already went into clinical practice where we can measure these factors. But bear in mind that we have the opposite situation um, where we have the cardiotoxic effects of the angiogenesis inhibitors in people who receive these angiogenesis inhibitors for the treatment of cancer, for example, renal cancer. And of course, these inhibitors are associated with high blood pressure. And that's the same mechanism as in preeclampsia, where we don't have enough of these growth factors and women develop preeclampsia, hypertension, and all these consequences. So it could be these growth factors that actually drive some of these um, phenotypes and the translation later in life. <laughs> 
We have also done some studies on, on vascular function. We have seen that if we look at women who had preeclampsia versus women who did not have preeclampsia, and this a few years, 10 years after their, their pregnancy, 10 to 15 years after their pregnancy, we also see a few differences here. So you see that women who had preeclampsia have a slightly higher blood pressure, still normal, but slightly higher than women who never had preeclampsia and a number of other changes. But what is really interesting is when we look at the endothelial function and adjusted for all these other factors that we've seen, you will see, oops, sorry, you will see that um, they have already in terms of flow mediated dilatation, that is one measure of endothelial function, women who had preeclampsia have an impaired flow mediated dilatation. So later in life, they have endothelial dysfunction. And this could again be one of the reasons why these women are more prone to develop hypertension and other cardiovascular diseases, because if they had preeclampsia, they have endothelial dysfunction later in life. And let's just skip over these or skim over these um, studies here. It's just to show you that there's many other mechanisms that link preeclampsia with cardiovascular risk later in life. These are micro RNAs, these master regulators of gene expression. And we've done a work here where we looked at women who had preeclampsia 10, 15, 20 years ago. We saw some differential expression in the micro RNA, micro RNA 206 here in various comparisons between different cohorts. So that was a very strong signal. And interestingly, we saw the same micro RNA dysregulated also in women who had preeclampsia in this very moment. So it's something that is dysregulated at the time of pregnancy remains dysregulated later in life. So this could be another molecular link between the two conditions. And this even translates to animal work. Look at these um, pregnant rats here. These are normotensive rats. These are hypertensive rats at different um, days during their gestation. We see these are urine peptide expressions. We see different peaks of different peptides in the urine. And basically what differentiates the two groups here, the normotensive group and the hypertensive groups, are a series of peptides here that we identified as deriving from a protein called uromodulin. And those of you who are interested in hypertension will know that uromodulin is one of these proteins that is really important for the development of hypertension. There's a number of um, genome-wide association studies, one led by Sandef Patmanaban in, in Glasgow, and Sandef has written this, this really nice paper a while ago, which shows how uromodulin interacts with salt reabsorption in the kidney. So again, a really, really interesting link of a mechanism that is well known to play a role in hypertension. And we have also shown that it plays a role in hypertensive pregnancy in rats, but we, has also, also, we have also um, translated this into hypertensive pregnancy in humans. So whatever that means, we have a number of molecular mechanisms that could explain why women with preeclampsia have hypertension and cardiovascular diseases later in life. Let's not spend too much time on these details, and let's rather look at um, what is really clinically relevant here. And there's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario, but let me let me start with this model that has been proposed by Navid Sattar and Ian Greer many, many years ago. And it's probably something that is, is still very, very true, but it is just a proposal. The proposal would be that if a healthy woman with, with normal vascular function would enter a pregnancy, the pregnancy would be a bit of a stress test to the cardiovascular system. But because this woman is completely healthy, she will get through the pregnancy without too many issues and will then continue on her life course. And it will take many, many years until she will develop or uh, reach the disease threshold where she will develop coronary disease or stroke or any other conditions. However, a woman who is subclinically unhealthy, starts at a slightly worse condition her pregnancy, will have the same stress factors, but now they already take her over a disease threshold, so she will develop preeclampsia or a placental syndrome. She will recover from this, but because she already started at higher risk, she will reach the disease threshold of future cardiovascular disease earlier than this woman here. 
So we could take, based on this hypothesis here, we could take the event in pregnancy as an early window into cardiovascular health and would say this just flagged up an underlying risk that was already existent before pregnancy and we need to do something really after pregnancy to identify these women or to treat these women in a, in a, in a useful way to prevent early onset cardiovascular diseases. Now, unfortunately, and this is where the chicken and egg comes from, this model here is based on the idea that the preconception cardiometabolic health drives, on the one hand, placental syndrome, such as preeclampsia. So if you already started a little bit more unhealthy, you're more likely to develop placental syndromes or preeclampsia. And the same conditions here will, the same risk, the same pre-existing risk will drive hypertension and diabetes later in life. So just for the sake of argument, here we would have an egg that starts early and from this the chicken, the placental syndromes and the hypertension, diabetes and cardiovascular disease will develop. Now you see already an arrow here, there could be an alternative model and we'll come back to this in a minute, but let's just think, could the um, proposal that Navid and Ian Greer have, done, have made a few years ago, 20 years ago, could this be true that all cardiovascular risk following placenta is actually driven by preconception cardiovascular metabolic health and that the preeclampsia is only one early window to see this pre-existing risk? And yes, that could be because if you look at the risk factors for preeclampsia, Many of them are typical risk factors for other cardiovascular diseases. So women, for example, who have chronic hypertension are at higher risk of preeclampsia. And of course, these women are also at higher risk of cardiovascular disease later in life. Women who have thrombophilia will be at higher risk of stroke, for example. Women who develop gestational diabetes are at higher risk or women with diabetes in the first place will be at higher risk of developing preeclampsia and these women will also be at higher cardiovascular risk or kidney disease or maternal age. So a number of these factors that would be typical cardiovascular risk factors are also typical risk factors for preeclampsia. Look at this one here. And that slide is always a little bit difficult to understand, unfortunately. So let's look at the systolic blood pressure after preeclampsia. If you look at the woman who had preeclampsia and you follow her up after many years after the preeclampsia, you will see that a woman who had preeclampsia will have a blood pressure of say 134. A woman who had a normal tensive pregnancy will have a blood pressure of 123, so significantly lower. So already proven when we have preeclampsia, the blood pressure is higher later in life can do a number of adjustments, but the difference is always the same. However, if we are lucky enough to have a blood pressure that was measured before pregnancy, and we do the same adjustments here for the blood pressure before pregnancy, then the difference between these two is not that great anymore. So meaning, in other words, that probably the pre-existing blood pressure really drives the development of preeclampsia and this pre-existing high blood pressure also translates into the long-term cardiovascular risk. So that is another evidence for the fact that the proposal by Navid and Ian is actually true or could be true. And indeed, when we do even more sophisticated measurements, and this is done by collaborators in Cambridge and London, what they have done is to look at the number of cardiovascular parameters before the first pregnancy. And then when the women were pregnant, they followed them up and saw if they developed preeclampsia. And one of the things that was really outstanding here was the total peripheral resistance. And you see that in women who developed preeclampsia, the total peripheral resistance was higher before pregnancy, before conception, compared to women who did not develop preeclampsia. So there was an underlying vascular disease with more resistance, with more being prone to hypertension that could then translate into preeclampsia and could, of course, also drive the long-term cardiovascular risk. Now, this is true for many other factors as well. So even glucose and HDL levels, for example, women who are 
developing preeclampsia and thereby have a higher cardiovascular risk long in uh, later in life also have already changes subtle changes to glucose levels to hdl levels they are slightly more higher the glucose levels likely lower the cholesterol levels the hdl cholesterol levels and this may translate again into long-term cardiovascular risk but may also expose uh, um, uh, make the risk for for preeclampsia higher in these women so that would be one concept to say it's all driven by preconception cardiometabolic health but let me just run the other concept past you it could also be that navid and ian greer were not right and that the preconception cardiometabolic health does not matter at all. And that just the episode of a placental syndrome, such as preeclampsia, is so bad that irrespective of what happened before pregnancy, this experience of having had a placental syndrome could be so bad that it triggers hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular diseases later in life. And let me just remind you of these um, angiogenic factors and the anti-angiogenic factors. Women with preeclampsia are characterized by these really high levels of anti-angiogenic factors. And if we just consider that somebody is for at least 10 weeks, if not longer, because they are raised already earlier in pregnancy, exposed to powerful anti-angiogenic factors as part of their disease process. We could argue that these 10, 20 weeks of being exposed to this on top of having really high blood pressure during the pregnancy, this in its own right could cause higher risk of cardiovascular disease later on. So it could also be to some extent independent of whatever the health was before the pregnancy. It could be that a preeclampsia, which may be caused by all sorts of causes, maybe genetic, maybe whatever, that the preeclampsia on its own triggers the higher cardiovascular risk. And this really leads to a little bit more sophisticated model. So this one would have been the original model to say, well, the ones who develop preeclampsia are the ones that are just starting off with worse cardiovas cardiovascular health. They develop preeclampsia as a window to see into their cardiovascular health, and they develop cardiovascular disease earlier simply because they are on a higher offset of their trajectory here. It could also be, and that's the alternative model, that both start pretty much at the same cardiovascular health before pregnancy, that the women with um, preeclampsia, for example, then just have a higher cardiovascular risk later on because the preeclampsia itself triggered something. And it could also be that way around that preeclampsia actually doesn't change much with your risk, but it's actually the healthy pregnancy that reduces your risk. So that would be a third, a third possibility to, to explain this difference in long-term cardiovascular risk. Now, the question is, of course, how do we answer this? And this leads to a really exciting study. That's the, the POPI study. And the POPI study is a, a study where we look at preconception to postpartum study of cardiometabolic health in premigravid pregnancy. And that's a study very kindly funded by Welcome. And the study is led by um, Ian Wilkinson in Cambridge, who is here. And we were all a little bit younger on this um, photo here because it took us a few rounds to um, get it through welcome funding, but we're very proud to have this welcome funding now. And then the pandemic made things a little bit more difficult, but I'm very pleased to say that we are starting the study pretty much imminently. Cambridge have already started and Glasgow and Imperial with um, uh, Christopher here. Um, and Christopher here are pretty much on the, on the way of, of starting this very soon. And what are we doing here? So we are recruiting women into a preconception study where we want to recruit 3,000 women and 500 controls. The 3,000 women are women who say, I want to be pregnant in the next year or so. And we give them a really, really good health check at this time. We do all sorts of cardiovascular assessments. We collect bloods and, and all sorts of things. And if we are lucky, about half of them will really be pregnant um, within the next year or so. And we will then follow them up, through, follow them up throughout um, pregnancy. Some of them will unfortunately develop preeclampsia. We will follow them also up after pregnancy, and we will then have the whole life course. We will, well, not life course, but the course throughout and post-pregnancy, and we will be able to really compare 
in detail their preconception cardiovascular health with their risk of developing preeclampsia and how this all comes back to normal or not quite after pregnancy. Now, is this feasible? Yes, it is. You have seen the total peripheral resistance data before. Um, we, uh, the colleagues in Cambridge and London were indeed able to recruit women before pregnancy, before conception, do very fine uh, phenotyping here, but now we need to upscale this from about 200 to 3000 across a number of, of centers. And we're really excited to do the study because it will really answer the question how much of the preeclampsia risk and how much of the long term cardiovascular risk is driven by preconception maternal health. And this is such an important question because it will help us to direct our um, preventative measures to either women before conception, if it's what Ian Greer and Navid Sattar proposed, or to after pregnancy, if they all start with the same level of cardiovascular risk. And that has really an implication on how we manage this, these women. Now, until we see the poppy results, what are the current guidelines for these women? Well, actually, it is the American Stroke um, Association who first discovered this increased cardiovascular risk and put it in their guidelines to actually say that an expanding body of research has shown that complications of pregnancy, so just the ones that we mentioned today, are associated with higher risk of future cardiovascular disease and stroke, of course. So they have put history of preeclampsia as one of the risk factors that we should always ask our female patients in our clinics because it has this kind of two to three fold higher cardiovascular risk. Let's go to the NICE guidelines. What do the NICE guidelines actually tell us about hypertension in pregnancy? Well, there is hypertension in pregnancy diagnosis and management guidelines, but they very much focus on preeclampsia the risk of recurrent preeclampsia, and they also say something about cardiovascular risk after preeclampsia. Now, for recurrence of preeclampsia, um, that is really important to give women who had one episode of preeclampsia advice and say, well, actually, you have a higher risk of developing preeclampsia again in your next pregnancy. One in seven women will have preeclampsia again. Um, but it's also important to give them some advice, and you've heard this number now several times, about two, two and a half to threefold higher risk of all sorts of complications in the longer term after a preeclamptic pregnancy. Now, you would, of course, rightly ask, what is NICE now recommending to do with these women? And the advice is very, very generic. The advice is to say, well, if a woman had a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, advise them how to reduce their cardiovascular risk. And this can be a GP or a specialist, so not very specific here. Avoid smoking. Well, all of us should avoid this. Um, look at the NICE guideline for cardiovascular disease. So this basically means if your lipids are very high or if your um, a science score or another Q risk or other score would be high enough, then take a, a statin, manage obesity and all these other things. But it's not very, very specific. And NICE has, of course, discovered this and has recommendations for research that really mean what exactly is required here, what is the antihypertensive treatment in the long term, what is the antihypertensive treatment in the postnatal period, how quickly can we wean women who had hypertension in pregnancy off their medication, and what is really the advice and follow-up in the community. Do we need to see them after six months, after six weeks, after six years? Do we need to see them annually? So there's a lot of questions that are not quite clear yet. So we came together recently from the BHS and from the UK Maternal Cardi Cardiology Society and very kindly sponsored and funded by the British Heart Foundation to just see what, what, what are the open questions here in the management. And we really asked the questions, who are the women who we need to screen after a complicated pregnancy in the long term? Is it only the ones who had preeclampsia or would these other placental syndromes also qualify for it? How can we make sure that all women who are at risk have access to such services and not only women who live in a certain postcode area or are of a certain age group or a certain ethnicity? Are there any priorities? Are there any women who need to be seen really, really early in this 
period after a, a, a preeclamptic pregnancy, especially those who plan another pregnancy or those who remain on medication, would they be at higher risk? When do we need to screen? Is it realistic to see women a few weeks after pregnancy and now talk about their cardiovascular risk when they're really much more interested in their baby than in their own long-term risk? That's is how biology works. Um, when is the period of greatest risk? How often do we need to screen these women? Is it annually? Is it just once? And we can then decide who is at higher risk and who is not at high risk. Who should do the screening? Is it GP? Is it specialists? Is it midwives? Is it health workers, um, health visitors? Is the focus on blood pressure or other cardiovascular risk factors, including lipids and diabetes, what is the long-term cardiovascular risk? So we found a little bit of answers to these. We would like to be very, very pragmatic, and we are just at the moment writing a statement to say we would probably focus on women who still have higher blood pressure six months after a preeclamptic pre pregnancy, and they need to be screened and monitored in the longer term, whereas women who have a completely normal blood pressure six months after pregnancy may not be at that high risk to justify NHS resources in these women for annual or other types of, of follow-up. But this statement is in the making, but these are questions that we're asking ourselves at the moment. What we definitely don't want to do is, for example, this paper here from American GPs, where you have uh, a really sophisticated postpartum screening um, model that starts already 12 weeks postpartum. This is simply not possible here, even starting four to 12 weeks postpartum for gestational diabetes. This is something that may work in a in a really overfunded, over um, subscribed, uh, o o o um, uh, very private uh, healthcare system, but not in an oversubscribed and underfunded healthcare system as we have it in the in the NHS, where we need to be a little bit more pragmatic and probably also a bit more realistic of what is possible. So our pragmatic approach here would be really, let's focus on the established modifiable risk factors in the postpartum period. This includes, of course, blood pressure, weight, BMI, smoking, and proteinuria. We would, um, we are not exactly sure if we should measure lipids and glucose levels in this period. We would rather focus on blood pressure. Um, this is our advice, but I, I look forward to what you think about this. Um, we do not know yet really where this should be done, whether it's in primary or secondary care. Um, if GPs are happy to do it, and most GPs do so already, we would prefer it to be done in primary care and only refer women who have consistent problems to secondary care. We would propose to, this, to do this at six months or one year, but not earlier, simply because it will not be possible and it may not be particularly meaningful in the earlier um, period after, after delivery. And um, the exact blood pressure threshold that will decide whether a woman will need intensive monitoring for a longer period of time or whether we can safely discharge her, that still needs to be defined and some research needs to be done. So that's probably around the recommendations that we will um, develop and, and propose. Now, one thing is really, really important. Women don't know about the high risk that they have after preeclampsia. Many women or most women will just be happy that they got through this complicated pregnancy, that they delivered a healthy baby and that their own blood pressure is much lower now than it was during the preeclampsia. So education to make women aware of the long-term risk and empower them to manage their long-term risk, I think that would be one of the clues. Then we don't need guidelines because then it's suddenly in the hand of the affected women. So this empowerment that we've seen during COVID, where of course self-monitoring and even self titration and treatment of high blood pressure worked extremely well in hypertension, but also in maternal medicine is a model that we would like to use in the longer term also for uh, women who had preeclampsia so that they just are aware of the risk and can look into this risk. And that it works. And please stay tuned and look at JAMA in the next um, few days or weeks. Um, this is work led by Paul Leeson, where I had the, the honor to be part with, and Jamie Kitt was the research fellow who did an extraordinary work here. They looked at, uh, in the POP-HT study, to empower women after hypertensive pregnancy 
to monitor their blood pressure, to self hydrate blood pressure medication down in that case and just take absolute care of their own health. And you will hopefully very soon see that see the data and it may not surprise you with one kind of idea of the study. Of course, women who self manage their cardiovascular diseases do better than the women who just wait for the next clinic appointment in 12 months to um, provide the appropriate treatment or in that case, the withdrawal of treatment that they don't need anymore in, in the longer term. So in summary, Placental syndromes are definitely associated with an increased cardiovascular risk later in life. And most data suggest that it is the pre existing, the preconception cardiovascular risk that increases the risk of placental syndromes. So that's maybe where we need to focus with our prevention to make sure that women who want to be pregnant enter their pregnancy in the best possible shape. First of all, to prevent them from developing preeclampsia, but also in terms of the long-term cardiovascular risk. But we should not completely forget the alternative hypothesis that an exposure to high blood pressure and exposure to anti-angiogenic factors for 10, 20 weeks during pregnancy could in its own right cause so much damage that this also translates into the higher risk and uh, higher cardiovascular risk late in life. And probably in reality, it's a bit of a mix. A bit of a mix of the two here. Um, these two concepts will have a bit of implication on prevention strategies. Shall we focus on preconception risk and optimize cardiovascular risk factors before entering a pregnancy, or shall we focus on post delivery, post natal management of those who happen to have preeclampsia? This is really important in terms of our preventative strategies here. And there is currently in the UK not a very specific guidance to say after six months, these and these parameters need to be measured. These are women's that you can safely discharge. These are women that you need to follow up. You need to do it annually. You need to do it every three years. These are the parameters that you need to measure annually. These are the parameters that you need to measure every three years. And I think the community needs to work on these um, guidances and these recommendations. Now, I'm aware that I did not really answer the question what to do with this woman. And I just put the slide in here again so that it hopefully informs our discussion. And I would be very keen to learn from you how you would handle and how you handle these, these women in your clinics. Um, do you do ambulatory blood pressure measurement every week, every year as I do in some? Do you discharge them from your clinic as I do in others? I just don't have a very consistent approach here. And I would be really, really keen to, to learn from you here. Um, in terms of acknowledges, acknowledgements at the end, so this was the BHS and joint with Sharp meeting just finished yesterday. This is the table here and I just randomly pick um, a few of the colleagues who really contributed to this work here. Della is doing a study also in uh, preeclampsia. We look at predictive markers, vascular predictive markers of preeclampsia, and she's doing a lot of this work here. And she also set up some of the, the poppy study that will be run by another clinical fellow. Shion was the um, uh, person who produced the data on the rats. Um, so you've seen this with the Euromodulin. Shion has recently worked with Lucy Chappell actually to translate this into, into humans and the paper will be out very soon. Humaira here in the background does a lot of the mechanistic work um, linking the Euromodulin, for example, to all sorts of conditions in pregnancy and out with pregnancy and hypertension. And there's a number of other um, students and former students in, in the table and there's many more in Glasgow who contribute to this to this really exciting work here. And I think the Sharp and BHS meeting just in the last few days was just such a prime example how we can look into prevention of cardiovascular diseases and women who had placental syndromes are just at higher risk of these conditions and it's so important to look at this. We have we are lucky enough to have funding from the European Commission Welcome and the British Heart Foundation. And I think that's really time to stop now, open it for discussion. And I would be so keen to hear from you how you deal with women who had preeclampsia and how you treat them in your clinics. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. That was fantastic uh, overview uh, of uh, preeclampsia and the conditions that uh, sort of attendant risk uh, with with preeclampsia. So I open the floor uh, to questions. Um, anyone who wishes to 
ask a question, please feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, turn your camera on. I see Rebecca has done so. So Rebecca, please do come in. Um, Gross Gott, Christian. Vielen Dank. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Oscar Sehr gerne, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm interested in two things. Uh, firstly, that smoking wasn't in that table that you showed us of uh, risk for preeclampsia. Bearing in mind that we know that smoking leads to endothelial dysfunction, and obviously yeah. we know you've got modulation of the flow dilatation is decreased, uh, but is that potentially an additive effect? So that's one thing. And I'm going to throw something else at you because um, I'm an identical twin and my mother had preeclampsia and her only risk factor was that we, it was a twin pregnancy and she was a smoker. Um, and we, we were quite little. I was a kilo. You wouldn't believe it, would you? And my twin sister was slightly heavier than me. Yeah, really. Uh, Ganal. And um, so I'm interested in the interaction with the trophoblast. And actually, has anybody thought of doing subsequent studies of whether the children of preeclamptic women then go on to have a risk of preeclampsia in pregnancy? We've, we've, it's been suggested, yes, possibly, in, in years gone by. Um, and whether anybody's looking at those subsequent pregnancies and those, that cardiovascular risk. Thank you. Okay. Becca, I will answer your question, but you have to answer my question, how you handle these patients in your in your own practice. But let's come back to this in a, in a minute. Um, so first of all, the smoking, it's almost deliberately not in there because there is this really um, strange finding that smoking is actually pre protective of preeclampsia. And that is a little bit weird. So one, one of the ideas behind this is that women who smoke expose themselves to hypoxia all the time and they may just be conditioned for hypoxic events so that they get through the pregnancy a little bit better here. So that would be one of the, the hypotheses. But smoking is really bad for, for everything, but it is one actually protective factor for... And then, then you can already imagine if it's protective of preeclampsia but bad for your long-term risk, then the models that bring these two together will just go haywire. So that, that doesn't work. Um, so smoking is a little bit of an anomaly here. In terms of the, the twin pregnancies, yes, of course. If you have two babies, um, that is more stress to the placenta or placentas. Um, so the perfusion will always be a little bit more challenging here. And the twin pregnancy is one of the risk factors for um, preeclampsia. So um, yes, your, your mom was at slightly higher risk of preeclampsia because of uh, the, the twin pregnancy. Um, preeclampsia runs in families, so if your mom had preeclampsia, you are at higher risk of, of preeclampsia. Um, and what exactly the mechanisms here are, again, I can't tell you, and there needs to be more research done, whether all the genetics in preeclampsia was actually not really convincing so far, um, but there may be a few hits here and there. Um, but it could be shared environments, it could be some epigenetic factors that indeed these babies from preeclamptic factors got something on their way in life that makes the risk of having preeclampsia themselves higher, but there is an increased risk, so it, it runs in families. So all very good good points, but need for, for more research. But answer the question to me, if you see women in your practice who had preeclampsia, what, what are you doing with them? Do you screen them or do you discharge them or do you just give some lifestyle advice? What are you doing there? Um, so we would screen them. I would certainly screen them uh, because I'm aware of the risk um, of future cardiovascular disease. Um, and we would keep an eye on their blood pressure. We do also have home blood pressure monitoring, which ties in nicely, uh, Christian, with your empowerment and yeah. Uh, yeah. getting the women on board as team players here, you know, managing yeah. their disease process. Um, and we can, of course, check their protein and their renal function. So this is not very different from what we're already doing. We've, we've really got it off pat in primary care for diabetes. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cinderella, if we look at the spectrum, is actually chronic kidney disease at yeah. the moment. Uh, yeah. You know, it may have been part of the contract in 2004 that GPs uh, look to keep a register and look at the protein urine and yeah. manage it, yeah. but that's not to say it actually happens. So yeah. a lot of that is about awareness raising um, uh, among our patients, but also us as clinicians and just being fastidious. Um, Christian, um, what a percentage. Uh, so our uh, practice population is eight and a half thousand. So how many women could I expect uh, of reproductive age to have preeclampsia, please? 
Well, that's a really interesting question. So you, you've seen these prevalence data. I think uh, we have about 50 to, to 60 per 100,000 of reproductive age in the developed countries that um, are at risk of preeclampsia. Let, let's put it the other way around. Most women at some point in life will be pregnant and the risk of preeclampsia in the UK is we always write two to eight percent, but in reality, it's about two to three percent these days. So that's probably the more important data that if somebody really wants to be pregnant or will be pregnant, we can say roughly the risk will be two to three percent. Um, but if there's underlying risk factors, the risk will be higher, like up to 10 percent or so. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I've got Colin Murdoch. Uh, Colin, please do come in. I know you do research. Uh, in you do a lot of research so... in this field. You can, you can answer all the questions, Colin. Hi. <laughs> Hi Christian, uh, thank you very much. I can see Jacob was already thinking of uh, investigating vaping in pregnancy. So um, uh, thanks very much for your talk, it's very good. Just on the poppy study, um, so we know that uh, high risk patients for preeclampsia are the groups of patients that are very difficult to get into clinical trials. So, um, and you, you know, you talked about that 2% there and presumably it's higher in different uh, backgrounds. So you, it'd be interesting to know how you're going to address that. And then I've got a second question if I can, and that's on neuromodulin. But, um, so neuromodulin, you identified as, as potentially uh, a factor contributing to preeclampsia. I don't think neuromodulin affects endothelial function, if I'm right. And so... Uh, I can see how that could affect the kidney, but do you think it's, where's the chicken and the egg there? Uh, 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 brilliant question. So the, the first one, if you looked at the investigators in Poppy, most of them sit in Cambridge, some places in London, and actually not the most deprived parts of the country. So Glasgow was brought into this to, to outbalance this a little bit, and we actually recruit in the um, Princess Maternal Hospital at the um, Glasgow Royal Infirmary. So that is probably a slightly more deprived area where we where we recruit into the, the study. But you're absolutely right. And this was, of course, I told you it took a few years to get uh, the funding because reviewers quite rightly criticized this. How do you select the women that actually are there? So you need to make really good offers to make it interesting to those who are at highest risk but would normally not engage that much with the, the medical services. So we, we we try as much as we can, but I do appreciate we will be biased. But even within this biased cohort, even in those where we think they're really uh, healthy and, and engaged and, and take part in such studies, we will still find some subclinical disease that is un unexpected. And if we see that this subclinical disease translates into preeclampsia, it will also answer our question to some extent. But I, I do appreciate it's a, it's a, it's a big criticism. Euromodulin, you're right, what is chicken, what is egg? Is it a marker of renal dysfunction or is it the cause of renal dysfunction, especially in preeclampsia? We cannot answer this at the moment. What I can tell you is that we find the same patterns of reduced um, neuromodulin in urine in human hypertensive pregnancy that we've seen in rat hypertensive pregnancy. Um, we have a bit of mechanisms in terms of where it comes from, whether it's uh, just protein or whether it's um, RNA. Um, we know that you mentioned rightly that some of the neuromodulin goes into the systemic circulation and causes vascular dysfunction, but we are still trying to understand exactly how this is um, happening. But yeah, it's it's just you know one one signal that we have, but it needs much more work. Thank you, thank you, Christian. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Christian, if I may, uh, just one observation and one question, really. The observation is I was fascinated by the FMD, the endothelial function of women with preeclampsia, 5.9%. So in, in the work that we've done with smokers, uh, chronic smokers have an FMD of 5.5%, which gives you an idea of how much of an insult to the vascular endothelium that preeclampsia is. But of course, your, your work going forward to find out whether it it triggers the whole sequelae or whether there's a pre-existing element to this would be interesting. But just uh, it it puts into perspective how how much preeclampsia affects your endothelium, that it's almost as bad as chronic smoking uh, in the long term. Thanks for reminding us. And bear in mind, these were women in their 50s. So we are still talking about the relatively yes. young and women again. So normally cardiovascularly quite healthy cohort. Yes, yes you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
And, and my question, Christian, really is uh, if you look at the NICE uh, guidelines, as you highlighted just now, it says uh, if you've had preeclampsia, then one in six chance overall uh, of developing preeclampsia in a subsequent pregnancy, which means five in six women who have preeclampsia don't get preeclampsia in a subsequent pregnancy. Uh, has there been work to look and see whether there, what the phenotypic or even genotypic differences between these two cohorts of women? Why do some women go on to get preeclampsia and others don't? Yeah, it's certainly linked again to, to other risk factors. So if you have obesity, if you have a, a thrombophilia condition, so, you know, then it's very clear that your next pregnancy will have preeclampsia again with, with very high risk. Um, the other thing is, of course, and that always sounds so soft to explain this, that um, the first pregnancy is the, the biggest possible stress test. And once the, the whole cardiovascular system has been used to a, to a pregnancy in a way, even if it was a complicated pregnancy, the next one will always be easier. Um, so that may sound terribly sexist now, but it, it will be easier than, than, than the first one. Um, so that, that sounds as soft as it gets, but um, other than traditional risk factors, I'm not aware of any kind of specific marker that would really help us to say you are one of the five out of six or six out of seven and you're one, you are the one at that very highest risk. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I can't see any other hands. Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Oh, We've got two, <laughs> quickly, fantastic. Faisal, uh, welcome Faisal, and please do ask your question. Thanks, Jacob. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Christian. Very nice to see you, and thanks for that very nice presentation. I guess this question um, uh, relies on uh, um, the father. Is there a, a, um, a contribution that comes from the paternal side, given that the genetic makeup is going to be a combination of both? And related to the earlier question, so a child, a male child born from a preeclamptic pregnancy, will that person have a greater likelihood of fathering a preeclamptic pregnancy? Basil, you have just written the grant that we want to write. Um, so that's, 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 really, that, that's really exciting questions. So first of all, in terms of the fathers, um, yes, they seem to play a role. Um, it's just extremely difficult to capture this because not every woman will be entirely honest about who the father of this baby really is. And that makes it a little bit um, more difficult, this kind of research. So there's always a degree of uncertainty in, in, in such studies. In the poppy study, we thought about collecting data from the fathers as well with this uncertainty in mind. Um, but then it's getting really, really difficult if you consent a woman and want to get then information about their partner. So we may want to do this as a sub-study or not, but we kept it out of this. And that is one of the problems of this, this type of, of research. Um, let's forget about the practical consequent, uh, practical issues here. The, the big question is really the, the second one that you asked. What, what is actually that the father contributes mechanistically to this? And if there was then a, a male offspring, will they have, for example, an epigenetic signature after the preeclampsia that they may give to their own children? And that is really a question that we're that we're proposing at the moment in a in a grant that we that we want to put together with you know sperm epigenetics and looking at, at these factors. And that will have an effect on cardiovascular risk in general, but also in cardiovascular risk after preeclampsia. I can't give you the answer yet, but the, the question is spot on, of course. Thanks, Christian. I hope you're successful with your grant. Well, let's see. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, Bill Simpson, I saw Bill's hand raised, uh, but it's come down again. So I'm guessing, Bill, do you have a question? Well, I said there was nothing to ask another question. It, 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 thanks very much. That was a great, great presentation, Christian. It took me back to a, a time, a long time ago, when an obstetric colleague and I, actually I, I'm a chemical pathologist, um, stumbled across the fact that um, uterine tissue produces HDL. Um, and I, I wondered whether the low HDL preceding the preeclampsia is actually suggesting perhaps some kind of uterine dysfunction that leads on to both the, the 
you know, as, as, as the initiator of the cardiovascular risk and of the preeclampsia, rather than the cardiovascular risk, you, you see what I mean? No, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And I can only apologize for my very narrow view on the vessels. Um, you, you, you're so right. Um, Dillis Freeman in Glasgow has done a lot of work on HDL and LDL in and other um, cholesterol subfractions um, in, in pregnancy. And you're absolutely right. The utilization of cholesterol in the widest sense um, is different between women who develop preeclampsia and women who don't. So I fully appreciate what you're saying. It's not only the vessels, it's also the metabolic aspects and say nutrition in the widest sense aspects and utilization of cholesterol that is different between these two groups. And that's, um, you know, a, another another big, big question. Um, and we, we, we collect bloods in, in poppy. We will certainly do these, these studies to say what is lipid profiles before, during and after pregnancy and see how much we can explain here. But you're, you're spot on. It's it's not only the vessels. I, I fully appreciate this. It, it is your your biochemical components as well. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Bill. And uh, once again, Christian, thank you for that fantastic presentation and participants for those very interesting and engaging questions. Um, before we close for the evening, can I just remind you, uh, if you have not already signed up for the SHARP annual scientific meeting uh, on the 20th of November at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, please consider attending. It's uh, going to be focusing on um, the cardiovascular impact of pollution. Uh, and we're also asking for abstracts. So if you have trainees who would like to put in an abstract or yourself uh, for the sharp prize, please do so. Um, and it would be great to, to see the breadth uh, of cardiovascular research uh, being done in Scotland. So once again, thank you for attending the sharp webinar. Uh, and uh, I just wish you a good night and bye.